over half of all farms in Ireland are producing output less than €15,000. So what can these farms contribute? And I think very much the environmental and social elements are there. And so if we have farmers who would like to stay on the land, if they have potential successors who would like to do so also, and they're interested in diversifying to some degree and uh, taking a more leading role, I suppose, in the management of biodiversity and agri-environment, that is very much a good thing and I think that we need to try and focus policy towards that. Hello and welcome to the Beef Edge, the Chagas Beef Podcast for all your latest news, information and advice for Irish beef farmers. I'm Catherine Egan and with the recent release of the National Farm Survey Small Farms Report, I'm joined by Chagas Research Officer Emma Dillon and Chagas Research Technician Kevin McNamara, both working on the National Farm Survey to discuss the economic, social and environmental sustainability of the farms. Maybe, Emma, before I start, can you outline the sample of farmers that were selected for the report? Yes, I suppose the annual sample that we collect through the Chagas National Farm Survey are representative of about 86,000 farms. And they represent farms with a standard output of over €8,000 per annum. And what does that mean? That means that they're farms that produce output to the value of up to €8,000. And so smaller farms, of which there are about 50,000, according to the last census in 2020, we collect data from them on a periodic basis. So we last collected data from them in 2015. We had hoped to do so in 2020, but with COVID, it was delayed. So the report that we launched last week was an analysis of data collected on those small farms from 2022. So the representative of almost 50,000 farms in Ireland, they're very small farms. Their average size are about 13 hectares and they tend to be dry stock farms, either cattle or sheep, and some farms who lease out a proportion of their land. So in terms of the output, as I say, they're quite low value. But I suppose the very interesting aspect about these farms is that they occupy 15% of agricultural land in Ireland and also, I suppose, their location, the fact that many of them are located along the western seaboard. So in terms of the regional dimension, over half of these farms are located in the north and west, with another one third located in the south and the remainder then in the eastern and midlands. So really a considerable part of the country with regard to the western part of the country and also the fact that they're contributing 15% of the land area. How do these farms differ from the rest of the farm population in terms of the environmental sustainability and their contribution to biodiversity? So these farms differ from the National Farm Survey farms that we collect data on annually in a number of ways. As we've already said, they're much smaller scale and they're also much more low input and have lower stocking rates. So they tend to use less fertilizer and they're more extensive overall. And so for that reason, then they tend to have a lower environmental footprint. And we also know that these farms are located in areas that are likely to be a good repository for biodiversity. And they are in parts of the country where there is a higher proportion of high nature value land. So overall, because these farms are less intensive and potentially have more to contribute in terms of biodiversity, they are more environmentally sustainable. And they're responsible for only about 4% of total agricultural GHG emissions in Ireland. Obviously, this level of 4% greenhouse gas emissions, Emma, is very low for these small farms. They have this lighter environmental impact because of their extensive nature. But I suppose overall, because they produce less output and it takes longer to finish animals, they do have a higher emissions intensity overall per kg of output. While these farms are small, as you outlined, in terms of the economic performance, what did the results show from the farms? So we know that these very small farms are operated on a part time basis, like many dry stock farms in Ireland. And we know that their economic performance is quite poor. And typically, the farm incomes that they reported in 2022 across the cattle and sheep were only about two and a half to four and a half thousand euro per farm. We did see a proportion of the farms who were leasing out some of their land and they tended to report higher incomes because of that rental income. Also, support payments are a large share of the income on those farms as they are on other dry stock farms for the larger NFS population. 
But taking into account the labour input and the fact that most of these farms are operated on a part time basis, on a per labour unit basis, the family farm incomes reported were probably about double of, of that average figure. So overall, their overhead costs tend to be high relative to the value of the output they produce. And as I say, the direct payments are particularly important in terms of income for those farms. And based off those results, Emma, the viability of the farms is very concerning when you see these results. Viability on the dry stock systems has been somewhat concerning over a long number of years. And that is particularly the case on those small farms, for sure. Over 80% of the farm households have an alternative income source within the household, be that a pension or an off-farm job. And given the slightly older age profile of these farmers, they do tend to have a high proportion of pension income within the household. And Kevin, given the role that you had in meeting these farms, Emma outlined there the income on the farms is very low and the study found that 80% of the small farm households had a non-farm income source. What impact is that having on rural Ireland, do you think? It's a good question, Catherine. Um, I suppose when I met these farmers, um, I have to say I, I, it was one of the most enjoyable things I've done since I've joined Chagas and, and also one of the most humbling because, as Emma pointed out, um, in most of these cases, the family farm incomes are quite small and without the direct payments, they're, they're, they're probably in the red. So what is motivating these farmers to do what they do um, it was the first thing that popped into my mind. And in most cases, these people, you know, absolutely adore what they do. Probably, you know, have inherited the land uh, and it's come down through generations. And their sole ambition is to see if they can keep doing something with that land. And there's also a social aspect for them because they feel part of the farming community. And for many of them, you know, going to the mart, um, buying bits and pieces for the farm there's a social aspect to it that without the farm enterprise there that they would be missing out on um a lot of the farms that i visited in fairness you know they were of maybe an older generation for the most part and that social connection is vitally important to them um there is you know from the data looking that maybe a quarter of these farms might be thinking of getting out and stopping over the next few years. But there is a cohort there that want to continue. Um, I think around 10% would like to expand if it's at all possible. Um, so th- there, are, there are people that want to keep going. And as the data highlighted, direct payments uh, have been a huge part of loan to do that. So maybe combination in the future of, of maintaining those and where possible, it was pointed out that this land area could be a potentially huge repository for biodiversity. Maybe schemes aimed at these farmers maintaining or enhancing that biodiversity could be looked at to give them alternative sources of income. And given the fact that you're meeting these farms, the social dimension you mentioned there, Kevin, these farmers are really playing an active part in the rural communities and the rural areas and building into society. What was your experience from that point? One thing I picked up on, and it might be a silver lining in COVID, that there was potential there for a lot of the working from home aspect now, um, allowing uh, people that might have been having to live nearer or in bigger cities can now work maybe originally where they're from because they don't have to commute to work this, you know, five times a week. It might only be once a week. And in some cases, I did come across situations where there was... Uh, people in their 20s or early 30s who had moved back and now had the opportunity to maybe build at home or, or, or buy in their local village and maintain what their parents or grandparents had been doing in the past. Because in most of these cases, over half the cases, a lot of these landowners had already identified a successor. And if these successors are there and they can work and have enough farm income, that will allow them to remain in the area. Those schools, those GA clubs, that rural community fabric has a chance of being kept together. What has changed in relation to these small farm operations? You know, you mentioned that the survey was done back in 2015 and even in the past 20, 25 years. What has changed on these farms now compared to 25 years ago? Really, we've seen a huge amount of consolidation and specialisation. And I suppose as a result of that, 
we have seen a reduction in the proportion of the of farms at this scale and of this nature. And that's confirmed by the recent census of agriculture in, in 2020. And we've seen that the reduction in this kind of smaller scale farms has happened at a faster rate than larger farms. And I suppose that is to be expected. But I suppose in terms of when we last looked and had a particular focus on these farms in 2015, I think there has been a change in the mindset. The conclusion from the last report really was that the status quo would remain on these farms and that most farmers just wanted to continue doing what they had always done. And I think there is a proportion of those within the 2022 report that are of the same opinion. But I think there certainly is more of an openness to do something different. And Kevin mentioned it there, that there is um, a willingness, I suppose, to perhaps lease out the land. Uh, Others have identified successors, and I think that's very positive. I think the proportion who have identified successors are less than on larger type farm operations. But that, I suppose, is not overly surprising because of the viability issues that there are on those farms. I think a real positive from the data is that over half of the small farm operators were interested in converting to organics and a further 40 percent were interested in further participation in agri-environmental schemes. So I suppose in going back to your questioning around rural viability and rural development, within the new cap, we have seen the broadening of the objectives and taking better account of sustainability in a holistic way. And so I suppose environmental sustainability has been at the forefront in recent years, and rightly so. But the social element and the people element is, I think, coming more to the fore. And some of the objectives of the new cap are around societal needs. And one of those is around regenerational renewal and also uh, rural viability. And I suppose they're very much intertwined with the future trajectory of these firms. And I suppose some may ask, you know, why the focus? Because they are so small scale. I think the fact is that they have a contribution to make. They're occupying quite a lot of the land in Ireland. And also the fact that many farms in Ireland aren't overly large. So a further 20,000 farms. So over half of all farms in Ireland are producing output less than 15,000 euro. So what can these farms contribute? And I think very much the environmental and social elements are there. And so if we have farmers who would like to stay on the land, if they have potential successors who would like to do so also, and they're interested in diversifying to some degree and uh, taking a, a, a more leading role, I suppose, in the management of biodiversity and agri-environment, That is very much a good thing. And I think that we need to try and focus policy towards that. And I think that in turn will have positive implications for the fabric of social areas and and the future viability of some of these regions. Most definitely the future of the small farms is critically important for the sustainability of the sector in Ireland. What help or support did you identify that these farmers would need to stay farming and stay functional viable? The Families and the farm households that need the support are potentially the ones who haven't identified a successor. Uh, Interestingly, when we asked the question about remote working, only about one third of them, less than one third of them, felt that the move to remote working would facilitate succession in those farms. So is there a more structural issue there? Perhaps that's not surprising where members of the household have located elsewhere. And of course, we have this issue of delayed succession and the fact that farmers are not considering handing over until later in life. And there are many reasons for that. And we know that Chagask Research has pointed to concerns around long term health care and future income streams and the importance of those direct payments there in in sustaining those farm households. So there are lots of areas where policy, I think, can support those farmers to do whatever it is they want to do to continue farming or for those who do want to consider uh, the future trajectory in terms of the next generation. So I think key areas for focus are around that social piece and also the agri-environment aspect. And I think there are win-wins there. So we know that there are serious economic 
big viability questions to be answered on these farms with very, very low incomes. We do know that the majority of them have other income sources. And Kevin touched on it there. We know that they are motivated by other reasons. Uh, continuing the farming tradition was one of them. And we know that within the report, 60 percent of the farmers have been farming for more than 20 years. So there are different motivations for them but i think that there are opportunities here to improve the economic environmental and social sustainability of these farms into the future by very much targeting policy to get those win-wins one important thing that emma picked up on there was that a big difference between 2015 and maybe now is that there is a change going on and i think what help also is, is the, the very fact that chagas are looking into this cohort that um, I think it would be a good idea, you know, this work was done on 2022 days, that, that may, maybe we, that within a kind of a, a shorter period of time, we get back to see how this thing is changing and progressing over the next couple of years. So maybe potentially looking at it, maybe 2026 or, or, or sometime like that, just to keep an eye on how this change is moving along. The Chagask National Farm Survey is part of this wider EU survey that's conducted across all member states. And Kevin is one of our data recorders who collects all of this data. And I suppose the survey has very much changed from having a financial and technical focus to now taking much better account of indicators of environmental and social sustainability. So into the future, the idea is that the data set will expand to take account more of these types of metrics. So where we can utilize existing data around the finances and the technical, that would be wonderful because it would free up space to ask more questions about the environmental contribution and also the social sustainability status of those households. And I suppose that's another point to add. As of yet, we do not have a very good measure of biodiversity contribution within the National Farm Survey, but it is something that we are working on in terms of looking at the, the habitats map and trying to link farms with the the high nature value and the, the, the habitats that they do have on their farms. So I suppose we can't manage what we can't measure and we do need to, into the future, as Kevin said, take better account of some of these aspects. And I suppose the societal and the biodiversity elements are are two prime examples of that. I know we've only touched on some of the key findings from the 48,000 farms that were surveyed, that they are covering 15% of the agricultural land area. Some of the listeners might like to read the report. Where can they access the full report? Uh, The report can be found on the Chagask website. And there are some nice summary infographics and some nice statistics there that people might be interested in. I'll include the links to the report in the podcast text. Before we wrap up, have you any final comments? Maybe, Emma, I'll start with you. I'd just like to acknowledge the input of the farmers and our data collectors and also the Central Statistics Office, who really facilitated the operation of the survey and allowed for the sample to be representative of the almost 50,000 farms within the country. And to thank you, Catherine, and your listeners for your interest in this area. And Kevin? Like Emma, I would be, uh, I'm actually looking forward to when we might be doing this again. Um, it was a great experience. And, you know, to, to this cohort of people, are, I, I think they're wonderful. And it would be fantastic to see how they are going to adapt and progress over the next couple of years. So I look forward to in uh, it's an opportunity to go do this again. That's great. Thanks very much, Emma and Kevin, for joining me on the show. You can catch up on all other shows and interviews from the Beef Edge podcast on the Chagas website at chagas.ie or you can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe so you never miss a show. For all other updates from our Beef program, keep an eye on our Twitter and Facebook pages. Until next time, I'm Catherine Egan and thanks for listening.